On November the 17th, 2002, there was a young man who was 21 years of age named Matt George, and Matt George was bitten by a rattlesnake on his lips. Now, I've heard of rattlesnakes biting people on their legs, on their arms, but their lips? How in the world did that happen? Well, here's the story. Matt George had run across a two-foot-long rattlesnake, not very big, just two feet long, and he captured it, and he put it in a container, and he decided he was going to make the rattlesnake a pet. Do not try this at home. (laughs) The same thing will happen to you. So he was so excited about his new pet, and he invited his friends over, wanted to show them this new pet rattlesnake. Who in the world would think you could tame a rattlesnake? So he wanted to show off this rattlesnake, and he put his hand on the back neck, the back of the head of the rattlesnake, because that keeps the rattlesnake from biting you, and he brought it up, and he kissed the head. And all of his friends said, you are so crazy. Don't you ever do that again. This is terrible. And he said, are you kidding? I do this all the time. And he brought it back up to his face, but he had accidentally loosened the grip a little bit, and the snake knew it and turned and bit him right on the mouth before he had a chance to kiss it. And I thought to myself, what a crazy man. What an absolutely crazy person. Here is the truth, though. This is exactly what is happening in our lives, and we hardly know it. The Bible says that Satan is like a serpent, wanting to bring us down, wanting to destroy our lives, and somehow, someway, we think we can play with it and tame it. It will always, he will always be trying to destroy us. And I want to talk to you about that very thing today. We're in a series going through, the whole series is just James chapter 1. Just the first chapter of James. In a series entitled Thriving in a Hostile World. And this morning, I want to talk to you in the third message about how to overcome tempting times that we face in our life. And it's found in James chapter 1 and beginning in verse 12. And notice what he says. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any person. But we are tempted when we are drawn away of our own, by our own lust and enticed. And lust, when it is conceived, bring forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. There are four key facts about temptation that James gives to us in this little passage. The first fact is this, every temptation is a test of our character. James says in James chapter 1 verse 12, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. That word trial comes from the same Greek word that the word temptation comes from. Both of these words are from the exact same word. And why is that? Because every temptation is actually a test is actually a trial in our life. Our reaction to temptation always reveals our character. Now, the truth is, it is our character at that moment. God is at work in our life. The Holy Spirit is moving in our life to change our life day by day by day and to change our character to be more like Jesus Christ. That's the good news. For when we fail, it is not a life sentence. It is a moment in time in which we see what has happened in our life, but it is not a life sentence. God is at work to change our character. Fact number two is that God never tempts us to do evil. Verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, God tempted me. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he ever tempt anyone else. God does allow us to go through trials. God allows us to go through testing times, but not for the purpose of bringing us down. He's the one cheering us on. 
He is wanting, he wants to be the one that moves us upward and forward. It is Satan who is using this to try to take us down. There's a third fact that we see in verse 12. When we respond correctly to temptation, there is an immediate inner happiness that comes in our life. He says in James chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. That word blessed is the Greek word makarios, and it is a word that means a profound joy, a deep seated joy and happiness in our life. There really is power in purity. There is power in purity. There is also great joy, deep abiding joy in purity because we know at the very moment that we were tempted and we said yes to God and no to the temptation. We have accomplished something wonderful. We have something great that has happened in our life. We've listened to God. And it brings a sense of real accomplishment and great joy to our heart. There is a third, a fourth fact that he gives to us also in verse 12. When our life is characterized by right choices, God has promised us a place of honor with him. Notice how he puts it in James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, the Bible teaches us that we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ and not anything else. None of us could ever be, ever be, ever be good enough to earn our way to heaven. None of us could be good enough. It is not good works. It is not good deeds that we do, no matter how many good deeds they are. There is not good deeds that earns our way into the presence of a holy, righteous, perfect God. We could never do it. All those people are thinking, well, I'm living a pretty good life. I'm doing pretty good. Well, they're kidding themselves. The Bible very clearly says that salvation's a gift. It is not earned. It comes by faith, by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ and not anything else. But our rewards in heaven are totally based upon our obedience to God. They are totally based on our acts of love and kindness toward God and toward each other. One day when we get to heaven, the Bible says that you and I will be given rewards and one of those rewards is the, the crown of life. In fact, there are several other crowns that are mentioned in the New Testament. One day we'll just talk about that one Sunday morning. But, but this, this crown of life that he is talking about is a reward we'll get when we get to heaven. It is not something that earns us our way to heaven. So the fourth truth is hey, when we get to heaven and we have followed God and we've been obedient to the Lord and we have done acts of love and kindness toward God and others, there will be a reward that God gives to us. Now, with these four truths in mind, what is Satan's strategy then for conquering us? What is he trying to do? Well, this passage actually explains it for us. First, sin begins with an enticing thought that we reserve in our heart. Notice how he puts it in verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his lust. The enticement, that's the key word I want you to grab hold of. That word that is translated enticement is a word that actually means bait, like fishing. Every one of us know that the success in catching fish the first part of that is the bait you use. As it just so happens, the second part of good fishing is to go with me. <laughs> and here is why. I present a diversion for the fish. I can't catch any of them. They won't let me catch them. But they, when they know it's me that has shown up to go fishing, they all relax. Uh, we already know we'll be fine. And so while they're thinking those thoughts, you can catch fish because they're not looking out for you. A case in point is last spring, uh, spring break. 
Uh, my oldest grandson, Jude, is, uh, uh, was 10 at the time we went. He's 11 now. And it just so happens he, he is just amazing. He has been, and it's been for years, he's been amazing at casting uh, the hook. It's just, he, I can't believe him. You could almost put a, a cross out there on the water and he can hit it. So we go out fishing, and we are fishing for in a, in a guy's pond, and we're fishing for black bass because that's what he's got in the pond. Now, we went out and got bait, and I put the bait on my hook. I threw it out there, and for about two and a half, three hours, I got one bite. I'm not kidding. I got one bite. I saw the cork go down. Man, I got him, and I tried to set that hook, started reeling him in, and about, about halfway, he got off the hook. High-fived all the other fish. Isn't Mark Hartman fun to play with? I mean, he actually thought he had something. Now, while this is all taking place, my grandson, Jude, is casting out, and there were some of those casting out. He didn't even, it wasn't even five minutes. He could barely cast out his line and have enough time to sit down in the chair, and he already had a fish. He was racking up so many black bass. And you know what? They're fun to bring them in. Bass are always a lot of fun to, to play, and he, he brought them all in. And the whole time, I'm, how, how is this happening? I explained to him that he's catching fish because of me. <laughs> I tried to explain. He never really caught a hold of the idea. Now, I had time to take a nap on the dock. He hardly had time to sit in the chair. And that is what has happened. Now, what is the bait Satan uses for you? The truth is, Satan knows every one of our hot buttons, every single one of us. He knows mine. He knows yours. He knows all of our hot buttons. He knows our weaknesses. And every one of the baits he uses to lure us in are all dealing with the weaknesses that we feel in our life. And for every piece of bait, there is a hook inside. Oh, it looks so yummy. It looks like this is so great. But there is always a hook inside that bait. And every single time, that bait includes our enticing thoughts. Enticing thoughts. Satan's bait will always center around enticing thoughts. Passing thoughts about wrong are not sin. Passing thoughts about wrong is not sin because, look, these are originating from Satan, not us. It is not sinful to have passing thoughts. But those thoughts that we grab onto and we welcome into our heart, those things when we grab hold of them and we keep them and we nurture them, that is where sin actually begins. Now, our heart, as I talk about our heart, I'm not talking about the thing that pumps blood. I'm talking about our motives, our desires, and our thoughts. That's how the Bible uses the word heart. Our motives, our desires, and our thoughts. This is why in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. I like another translation. I think it's really great and far more understandable when it says this, above all that is to be guarded, be sure to guard your mind. Because from your thoughts, your whole character flows. The key to winning is to get in control of your mind to put a guard around your thoughts. Every sin that emerges in our life have all come from harbored thoughts. And Satan knows this, and this is why he brings the temptation across our heart. If we don't grab it, if we push it away, we have just solved that issue. I read about a guy named Bobby Leach, who years ago decided that he wanted to drift over Niagara Falls. Here's a picture of Niagara Falls. Look at this. He got in a barrel and he purposely wanted to fall off the Niagara Falls in the barrel. Who are these people? Kissing snakes and falling off of... Who does this? Did you know what I've noticed? 
There, I've never noticed one female to do anything like this. <laughs> have, you, have you ever known a female to do it? It's always the guy. So if you're raising boys, you watch them like a hawk because there's no telling what dumb thing is going through their brain. So he gets in a barrel, he's floating along, he goes right over Niagara Falls. And you know why I did it? He said, I did it because I didn't know whether going over Niagara Falls would kill me or not. I had to find out, will this kill me? What? See what I'm saying? See what I'm telling you? So guess what? In a barrel, he went over Niagara Falls, and he didn't even get a scratch. Two days later, he's in his kitchen, he slips on a banana peel and breaks his leg. Over Niagara Falls, not a scratch, in the kitchen breaks his leg. And the point of this illustration is simply to say, Satan oftentimes doesn't come to us in the big things. Sometimes it's the little things. This is nothing. This is no big deal. This isn't even a temptation. He comes to in the little things in our life. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a mess, and we can hardly believe it. The first step to sin is a wrong thought that has been retained in our hearts. So what, what is the hot button in your life? What is the weakness that he keeps coming after you with? Because every one of us in this room, every one in, bo- in all three campuses, every one of us have hot buttons. Every one of us have weaknesses. The second step to sin is a lustful desire. Look at verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. What was a harbored thought has now become a deep desire. And here's what we say to ourselves. I would never do this. I would never do this. But I, I'm just window shopping. Come on. I, it, it, it's, it, I'm just wondering what it would be like. And of course, I would never trip that wire. The desire is expressed in James as a lust. The word lust means any good thing. Good thing. Any good thing. Any good thing that oversteps the limits that God approves. So when we think of lust, we usually think of sexuality, lust of sexuality. We usually think in those terms because it's used so often in those terms. Anything beyond a relationship of of husband and wife, the Bible says, is over the line with God. It oversteps the line, oversteps the boundaries that God has established. But that's not the only kind of lust. Pride can be a lust. There is a good kind of pride. I'm I'm, I'm just proud of my uh, parents, keeping myself up, proud of of my work, and I try hard. I try to do a good job, proud of, of the things I have. I try to take care of those things, that kind of pride. But when the pride goes past the boundaries that God has established, it becomes rebellion. It becomes arrogance. And did you know that every single sin, every single sin in our lives has an element of pride, of arrogance, of rebellion as a part of it. But it also, money, possessions, anger, work, sports, anything good. Anything good that goes beyond the boundaries that God establishes. A thought life out of control develops a hidden desire to exceed the boundaries God establishes. And in the process of it, it blinds us. Not physically, but spiritually, it blinds us. It takes down our defenses. See, I, I've, I've been ha- having these thoughts all this time. I've been having this lust all the time. I've never done anything wrong about this. And so it blinds us. It's crazy to think about this, but this is true. In parts of the continent of Africa, there are whole populations who by the time they get to 55 years and older, 60% of them, 60% of the adults, 55 and older, become either partially blind or fully blind by ages 55 and older. And they were, this is so strange. Why is this happening? How is this happening? I don't understand this. And then they finally figured it out. 
there is in those sections of the continent of Africa a black fly that bites people. We usually think of them as annoyances, but not the black fly. They, they bite people. And those flies, when they bite people, some of them are infected with parasites. And when they bite the individual, they actually bury parasites under the skin of that person. Now, these parasites that they secrete under the skin of that person really multiplies very quickly. And they grow. Some of them grow very long. There are some of those parasites that actually grow two feet. And they go throughout the body. In fact, I w- I've been told you can actually see a parasite underneath your skin moving because they come so close to the, to the flesh. You can see them <laughs> moving in your body. I mean, this is like one of the horror stories that you might see on TV. But when one of those parasites finally reaches the eyes, it will partially or fully blind the person. And here's what I want to say to you. Everything we're toying with, everything we're playing with, I'd never do that, of course. I would never commit that. And I'm just playing with just window shopping. Every one of these things will eventually blind us spiritually. I'm fine. There's no problem with me. Everybody sins. I don't, they will blind us. Then James says there is part three. Step three to sin is the act itself. Now that's not when the sin begins. The sin begins with the harbored thought. But how it then outwardly expresses itself is the act. James 1.15, and when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. I would never do it. I'm just toying with it. I, I'm just imagining. I'm just fantasizing with it. But I would, of course, never do it. How many stories do we read in the news that we hear in the news of somebody doing something so outlandish? How in the world could they have done that? How in the world they could do that is they toyed with it. And then what happens is all the circumstances come together. All the circumstances, one moment, you don't even know. It just hap- it happens to appear. There it is. All the circumstances come together. And that person trips the wire. And they do what they thought they would never do. And this is what Jeremiah 17, 9 is saying. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't even know ourselves. We don't even know what we're capable of. That's what he is saying. Because when you and I toy with a lust long enough and all of the circumstances line up, it is amazing what we would do. One of the areas that men struggle with the most is in the area of pornography. And this is why, you know, there are books, Every Man's Battle kind of thing is a great struggle that men go through, but not just men. The fastest growing area is now females. And what happens with this is that it's just played with it. It, 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 it toyed with it. I'm never going to do anything wrong. I'm never going to cross over any lines. But what happens with that is that it just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. And that is where we come to step four of sin. It becomes a stronghold in our heart. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 talks about a stronghold that evolves, that that develops in a person's heart. A stronghold is a habit that is so much a part of your life that you have lost control. I will always be in control. I will never do that. I am all, I always, I've got, I got a hold of this. But what happens is over time, You don't even know it's happening. You're losing control. You're losing control. And now there are chains. And now you are under something else's control. And James 1.15 says it this way. Then when lust has conceived, it brings birth to sin. And sin, when it's accomplished, brings forth death. The death that he's talking about 
is the act of giving ourselves over to a stronghold that steals away the life God intended for us to experience. It kills our marriage. It kills our, 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 the, the trust. It kills the, our, our kids' respect of us. It, it kills the respect of others. It destroys. And that's the idea that James is talking about. It brings forth death. So how do we overcome temptation in our life? There are really, very quickly, five key principles of dealing with temptation. Five key principles. First, accept personal responsibility with repentance. We're we're in a society of irresponsibility. Everybody's a victim. Every human being today is a victim of something. And it's almost like a badge of honor somehow. I'm victimized. Everyone is victimized. And everyone, it seems like, it's not everybody, I'm, I'm exaggerating that, but it seems like everybody is somehow victimized by something else or somebody else, and it is to pass the blame, and it is to develop excuses. Now, there are some people that actually are victimized, so I'm not discounting that. But so much of what happens in many of our lives is, is, is attributed to somebody else's responsibility, blaming somebody else and, and accusing other people and not myself. But here's the truth. If you're going to overcome any stronghold, you've got to come to a place to own it. I did this. I made these choices. I did what was wrong. And this is the whole idea of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, this is what he is saying. That whole idea of confession is simply saying, God, you are right about this. This is sinful. And God, you are right when your Holy Spirit is convicting me, I did it. I made this decision. It is being willing to own our sin. And call sin what it is. Call it what God says it is. And be willing to own it. Not blaming other people. Not making excuses. Confessing our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And this is the great thing. Not just to forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is like he has cleaned the slate. You have been forgiven. You don't have to keep carrying this. You have been forgiven. And you have been cleansed. When we are willing to own our sin, turn to God, ask for forgiveness of that sin, walk away from it, we have been forgiven and cleansed. And it is under that idea that is part two. Our eyes need to be open to now the consequences of that sin. We've gone to God and we've gotten purified, we've gotten cleansed, and and now we want to stay this way. We want to keep going in the right direction. God, I own it. I've asked your forgiveness. You have forgiven me, and you have cleansed me. Now, I want to open my eyes to the consequences of this sin. Who have I wounded? How have I damaged others and myself? I want to see it full view in front of me. I want to see the consequences of my own actions. That's the idea. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Don't be misled. Remember that you cannot ignore God and get away with it. You will always, circle the word always, you will always reap what you sow. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death. Circle the word consequences. It's going to happen. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. You may be sure that your sins will, circle the word will, find you out. These people that think that they can steal money and from companies and all that kind of stuff, do you not know you're going to get caught? May not be today. It's coming. And now you got to live with all of this sense of guilt. you got to live with afraid that somebody's going to find out, somebody's going to catch you. It's not worth this. And then you're going to get caught. Because God makes you and I a promise, your sins will find you out you got to stop this. you got to stop it for a moment, and you've got to take a look at the damage. What, what 
damage will I bring to my spouse? What damage will I bring to my children? What damage am I going to bring to my reputation and people, how people think about me? What damage am I bringing to my life? It's not worth it. I'm going to tell you something. There is pleasure in sin, but the consequences of sin are far greater than the pleasure. It's far greater. So you've got to open your eyes to the truth about the consequences. Third, refocus our attention. If it's true that, that sin comes from inner thoughts, we got to change the way we think. And here's what I'm going to say to you. Don't wake up every day and say, oh, God, please, I don't want to do that sin again. I don't want to do that sin again. Every day, oh, I'm going to fight as hard as I can. I don't want to do that sin again. That is exactly the opposite of how to be successful. Let me give you an illustration. When I was taking driver's ed, a few years ago, taking driver's ed, the driver's ed instructor, as he is taking us around, we're learning to drive, he made the statement to us, whatever you do, and you're on a two-lane highway, and you got this car coming at you, and you're going at this car. Whatever you do, don't look at the car that's coming towards you. Now, you can glance, because that's just being safe as a driver. You can glance, but don't stare. Don't put your focus on the car that is coming to you. And why? Because what happens is, is that whatever it is that we are gazing at, we have a tendency to move to. And we don't even know it. And here's what he said. If you look, if you gaze at the car that is headed your way, you will, and you won't even mean it, you won't even know it's happening, you will begin to steer toward that car. He said, you know the white line in between? You glance at it, but you don't gaze at it. Because if you do, you will actually move to the white line. What you do as a driver is that you are aware of your surroundings. You glance in your surroundings, but you gaze straight down that lane. And if you gaze straight down that lane, your car will go there. Now, how do I apply this? If all of our gaze is about not doing something or not being like somebody else, because that person is a mess. I don't want to be like that person. If all of our gaze is in that direction, subconsciously we don't even know we're doing it. We will actually turn in that direction. No, he says what you need to do is you need to find where you want to go, where you need to go, who you want to be, and gaze at that direction. You can glance around. That's okay because you're being a defensive driver. But you gaze at who you want to be, where you want to go. And you get up in the morning and go, God, this is the guy I want to be. And God, I'm going to follow you today. And that's where your gaze is. Now, listen to what the Bible says about this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Now, dear, now, and now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say one more thing as I close this letter. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Why? Because that's where you will drive your life to. So you find, oh God, this is the person I want to be, the man, the, the woman, the teenager I want to be. I want to be this person. And every morning you get up, God, I want to follow you. I can hardly wait for the opportunities to choose because I'm going to choose you. And you put your gaze in where you want to go, who you want to be. Don't focus on what you don't want. Focus on what you do want. And then, fourth, cut off its opportunity to grow. Cut off the sin's opportunity to grow. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Now, he's talking about lust, so it's the same subject we're talking about. And what does he say? Make no provision for the flesh. So what does that mean? It means if your problem is alcohol, don't go to a bar and watch other people drink. Because it won't be long until you're going to be drinking. If you don't want to be stung by a bee, don't hang around bees. What it means is, if you've got to get in up, stand up and leave the room in the middle of a movie, 
at a movie theater, stand up and leave it. Change the channel. Don't hang around people that are driving you down. Hang around people who are pulling you up. This is what 1 Corinthians 15.33 is saying. Bad company corrupts good character. Hang around those people that are driving you up, not driving you down. So here's what I'm going to say to you. If the problem is the internet, you've got to get an internet filter. You might have to have five filters. It will slow the internet down. Better to slow it down than let it destroy you. Get a filter. When our boys were teenagers, actually in grade school, we got a filter. We had a filter. We had them so filtered and all the way. And then they're gone. You know what we did? We kept the filters. We kept the filters. You know what? We got grandkids now. We got filters, man. And put a filter on YouTube. You can put adult filter, parent filter, whatever it's called, on YouTube. Do it. You need to find everything you can do. Oh, my kids are too young. They're no problem. Oh, but the problem is, is that it comes after them. That all of a sudden something pops up. Don't know what that is. I click it and oh, my soul. You need filters. You need to make sure that the, the, the computer is out there in front of everybody, God and everybody, and so that everybody can see what is happening. Why? You're, you are making no provision for the flesh. You're smart. And that is what number four is about. Uh, there's a story. There was a, a drug dealer that came to a, a guy who was... Uh, a, a, a captain of an of a oil uh, tanker, and he had a re regular run between South America and Los Angeles, and he had this oil tanker. And so they came to him and said and asked him, "Would you let us hide drugs on your tanker? And if you will, we'll give you ten thousand dollars." And he said, "No." They came back in a day or two and said, "We'll give you fifty thousand dollars." And he said, "No." Came back in a day or two and said, we'll give you $150,000. And he said no, and he called the police. Well, when the police came, caught, oh man, it was just like, you can't believe all the drugs and money they caught in that sting operation. The police asked, why did you wait to $150,000 before you called us? And he said, because they were getting dangerously close to my price. <laughs> okay. It's called making no provision for the flesh. And here is the fifth thing. Invite Jesus Christ to be at the center of your life. You're never going to win over any of these things without spiritual power, without the power of the Holy Spirit resident in your life. You need to give your heart to Christ. You need to give your heart to Jesus Christ and let him begin to change your life from inside out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We come to you today. We ask, Father, move on all three campuses. Be honored by our response to you today. Father, may many come to know Jesus as their Savior. May many join this church. This place just feels like home. I want to be a part of Sugar Creek. God, move in so many people's hearts to come to genuine repentance where they need to be and start moving in the right direction about dealing with these strongholds. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.